and okay and uh, Stu will let you take over okay good morning again everyone and uh hi David thank you for uh, for joining us appreciate that uh David uh, was the New York Times weekly tech columnist uh, from 2000 to 2013. Um, he's a five-time Emmy winner for his stories on the CBS Sunday Morning, a News Times bestselling author, a five-time TED speaker. If those of you who watch or listen to um, NPR, you might be familiar with the TED Talks, uh, and a host of 20 um, Nova science specials on, on PBS. Um, he's got a new book coming out um, in two weeks, published by Simon & Schuster, and it's called How to Prepare for Climate Change. Um, I understand he's uh, going to give us a sneak preview, preview today of, of that book. It should be extremely interesting. It's certainly a topic that we're all interested and concerned about. So uh, with that, I introduce uh, David Pogue. Go ahead, David. Well, thank you. Nice to meet you, gentlemen. I myself was a Stanfordite for nine years, so I know your turf very well. Um, the New York Times interviewed Barack Obama's uh, science czar in uh, 2007, and he, he said this quote, which has now become sort of famous in climate circles, which is that uh, we have three ways to deal with the change in climate, mitigation, adaptation, suffering. And it's up to us to decide what the mix is going to be. So mitigation means trying to stop climate change. And you've heard this advice a thousand times, you know, fly less, eat less red meat, drive an electric car, all that kind of stuff. Uh, try to try to uh, move away from fossil fuels. Hardly anyone talks about the second part of that formula, which is the adaptation part, which means coping with it, sort of getting used to the changes. Um, and, you know, from my point, we need to start thinking about that because 93% of the new heat has gone into the oceans, which will take a lifetime or two to cool down, even if we stop burning fossil fuels tomorrow. So uh, there is such a thing as adaptation if you are a government, if you are a corporation. Um, they're building massive seawalls. They're moving the the farm belt northward, they're developing drought proof seeds. So there, there is a lot of adaptation going on, but, but nothing like nothing in the personal space for us, non-institutional entities. So that's, that's what this book is all about. Um, it's about what the individual can do to prepare, you know, it's, it's where to live and how to invest and how to ensure how to talk to your children, what to grow, how to reinforce your house, things like that. So uh, let's see, if I can share my screen here, uh, I am going to attempt to, uh, let's see, can you guys see that? Yes. Are you seeing the yes. book cover? Wow, it works, technology, oh my God. So the book comes out in 12 days. I'm very excited, I've been working on it for two years, but lucky for you, you can order it right now on Amazon. Uh, but lucky for you, you are going to get the best of the book today in How to Prepare for Climate Change, The Talk. So just to recap briefly how the greenhouse effect works, um, the sun has always shone on the earth. The sun has always heated the surface of the earth. The earth has always reflected some of that heat as infrared energy. And th there's been this blanket of carbon dioxide and methane and some other gas is that acts as a, a shell that traps some of that heat from bouncing back into space, which is a very good thing because without <coughs> it, we would be a big frozen ice ball. Um, this is known as the greenhouse effect, which I argue is a terrible name because whoever knows, what America knows what a greenhouse is? How many Americans have ever stepped from the hot, moist interior of a greenhouse into the outdoors and felt what a difference makes in temperature. I think a more consumer friendly term might be the dog in the car effect because it's the exact same thing. The sun goes into the car, heats up the interior, the infrared energy tries to escape, but it's trapped by the glass. So it gets really hot. Well, we're the dog. 
So anyway, there has always been rising and falling of temperatures and carbon dioxide levels. Uh, this graph shows that about every 100,000 years, we've had a huge spike in the carbon dioxide levels. It's completely natural. What isn't natural is if you look at the right end of this graph at the zero mark, which is the last 150 years, this happened. Uh, it's never happened this fast, and it's never happened this high. Uh, we have not been at this amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for 10 million years. Um, now, if we zoom way in on that and expand that vertical line to 150 years, we'll see it, it curves up like this, and that's basically since the Industrial Revolution, since we started burning uh, coal, oil, and gas, um, that was, uh, now if we superimpose temperature on that graph, you can see why scientists think there's a correlation between the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the temperature of the planet. Uh, they, they really align nicely. At the moment, we are releasing 152 million tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere every 24 hours. This is human generated um, emissions. Um, it's you know mining, agriculture, melting permafrost, burning forests, cropland, transportation, and so on. So not only is the greenhouse effect problematic, but the term global warming is also problematic because um, it suggests that warming is the problem. So what really happens, uh, let's see here. Uh oh, I've lost my, oh, there we go. Uh, we are getting freak heat, but we're also getting, uh, I can't seem to advance the slide. Hmm. How do you like that? There we go. We are also getting freak snowstorms. We are getting droughts, but we are also getting intense unheard of rains. We're getting flooding, yeah, but we're also getting water shortages. So it's, you know, nature is this collection of systems and networks. And when we start fiddling with one of the knobs, all kinds of other knobs go nuts. This is the stuff you see the headlines about. Uh, Record-breaking wildfires, never had a hurricane season this, this active as the one we just had. Huge beetle infestations in the Pacific Northwest killing 100,000 trees a day. Um, tick habitat is moving north, losing all kinds of crops. People are having to move because of climate. And also all this wacky stuff that you don't hear about. I mean, bizarre things. The tornado alley is shifting to the east. The beaches are getting smaller. Chocolate's getting more expensive. There are more kidney stones. Some kinds of goats are now 25% smaller. PSAT scores are affected. It's really strange. All kinds of unanticipated effects are occurring. <clears throat> global warming is one term for it. I think maybe the better one is global weirding <laughs> or climate chaos because all kinds of nutty stuff is going on. And we're talking about record-breaking stuff. This, you know, these wildfires this year, last year were insane. In California, Oregon, and Washington, uh, five million acres burned in wildfires. That's the entire area of our state and Delaware and Rhode Island in one fire season. Uh, this was San Francisco. This is a picture taken at noon in September. We had the worst, it had the worst air quality on earth, four times worse than Beijing during those wildfires. Australia's wildfires last year, also very famous. The smoke cloud eventually grew to the size of the continental United States and created hazy skies in South America, half a planet away. Great quote by me <laughs> in the book. Um, and we're not just, it's not just, uh, you know, um, North America and Europe at, 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 in the danger zone. Um, incredibly, last summer it reached 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit in freaking Siberia. <laughs> and they had wildfires, of course, in Siberia. Um, overall, you can see the general outline of how many more wildfires we're getting since 1980. Um, and as you can, as I mentioned before, 93% of our trapped heat is going to the oceans. 
Um, and the problem with that is you might have learned about the water cycle when you were in elementary school. Um, the warmer the water is of the oceans, the more water evaporates into the air. And the more water there is in the air, the more it rains. And the more it rains, the more water rushes back to the seas and the cycle <clears throat> continues. So for every degree warmer the earth gets, 7% more water vapor goes into the air. So when you get more moisture in the air, you get bigger, more intense rainstorms. And that is indeed exactly what we've been seeing since 1950. This is the, the graph of how many of these hyper-violent rainstorms we've been getting. Um, this is Washington last summer, six inches of rain in two hours. This was Michigan last spring. The dams broke and flooded entire towns. There's a little helicopter flyover. Um, last spring, the breadbasket states had devastating rains. Two thirds of Nebraska's counties declared a state of emergency, and that's why they lost twenty billion dollars worth of crops. It was just underwater. Uh, on the lighter side, I enjoyed reading this headline. This is the Noah's Ark replica in Kentucky. <laughs> they had so much rain. They had to file a million dollar insurance claim <laughs> for the damage to the Noah's Ark replica. Um, so hurricanes getting bigger and more frequent. Hurricane Katrina, everybody remembers, 2005 killed 1,800 people. Hurricane Sandy, you may really remember, that was here, 2012. That was the biggest hurricane ever recorded on the planet, a thousand miles across. Um, and part of what happens on the coast, by the way, you might hear this term storm surge. It's, it's a huge mound of moving water and it gets created when storm winds push it onto the shore. And then you've got the seawall sloping up, the sea floor sloping upward. And that of course makes the mound get even taller. During Hurricane Katrina, the storm surge was 28 feet tall. I just think that's absolutely incredible. <laughs> Um, this was Manhattan during Sandy. You remember this. Overall, according to the government, we used to get these storms of that size once every 500 years. By the year 2017, we were getting them once every 25 years. And 10 years from now, we'll be seeing storms like that once every five years. So that whole thing about this is a 100-year hurricane or 100-year storm, that's outdated technology. In fact, I was just reading, you know how they rate hurricanes on a scale of one to five, like a category five hurricane? The meteorologists are saying they're all falling in the fours, fours and fives now. We're going to need to expand the scale. We need, to, we need a hurricane category six. Um, so if you add all of this stuff up, the heat waves, the droughts, the fires, the hurricanes, and total them, this is the big picture. So we are now getting four times as much of that stuff as we did in 1980, quadrupled. Now, uh, the Yale Center for Climate Communications does a poll every year. When, when we hear the term climate deniers, it's really an ambiguous term because some people used to say the climate isn't changing, that kind of climate denial. And I'm not sure that exists anymore. I mean, you just, you just look out the window, you see that the climate is changing. The, the other question is, are humans causing the change? That one's still up for debate. I mean, it's not up for debate, but it's still argued by uh, a third of Americans. Um, that number is dropping every year, by the way. Every year they do this poll and the number keeps dropping. But the beautiful thing for me, for, for the How to Prepare for Climate Change book is, it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> Whether you think it's a natural cycle or whether you think humans are causing this with our burning of fossil fuels, you can't argue that the climate isn't changing. So you still have to prepare. Uh, and that brings us to the book and the main subject of this little talk. Um, as I mentioned, these are the topics of the book. Um, it's where to live and how to build and so on. Also ch chapters on the individual extreme weather events that you might encounter, flood, heat wave, drought, tornadoes, and, and so on. So I thought maybe I'd cherry pick the most interesting stuff and present it for you. I, I had the full 11 hour presentation ready to go, but 
your organizers were all in my face about, no, you have to limit your talk to under seven hours. So yeah, I'm just going to give you a selection of the, of the best stuff. So where to live? It turns out that every part of the country is experiencing climate chaos. So the, the basic idea here is you want to be inland from sea level rise and flooding. You want to be far enough north that you escape the heat and the mosquitoes and the ticks. You want to be far enough west to avoid the hurricanes on the east coast and the south and the Gulf Coast. You want to be far enough east to avoid all the wildfires and the one nobody talks about. You need fresh water. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but huge parts of the country from the Midwest to the West are having massive uh, water shortages. They used to get their drinking water from a couple of sources. There's like the Hoover Dam, which supplies water to Nevada and California, 25 million people. Um, that is now one third full. We used to get our water from aquifers, which are these huge underwater storehouses of water. Those are at historic lows all over the world. And in the West, they used to get their, uh, their water from melting snow mass up in the mountains. And now the winters are shorter and warmer so there isn't very much snow up there. So there's, you know, California has been in a drought for eight years, historic drought. Um, so there's this cool website called surgingseas.com. When we want it, when we, if we talk about the East Coast, we talk about sea level rise. And it's kind of cool. You can plot any address and then see what the water levels are going to do over the coming decades. So if we want to see what Westport, Connecticut, where I live, is going to look like by 2100 with a nine foot sea level rise. That's it. I mean, big chunks of the city are going to be underwater. Not as bad as Boston, though. Check this out. I mean, Boston's in real trouble. And Miami, I mean, Miami is the poster child for sea level rise. I mean, that city is going away. Check it out. I mean, they're saying it'll be 93% underwater. In fact, all of Southern Florida, if you zoom out, you can see that like we're losing that tip. And it's not just because of sea level, like, like, like people think, well, we'll build a big seawall. That's not going to help you because the problem is that the, it, much of Florida is this porous limestone. So seawater is coming up from underneath you. And now we're getting this thing called sunny day flooding which means not even during a storm, not even during a hurricane. This is just a matter of the high tide, these pictures you're looking at here. Uh, it's affecting the real estate down there. Um, so, you know, climate change uh, migration is a new term we're hearing. People moving because of the climate change. These are the effects of Miami real estate, Florida real estate based on tidal flooding now and this is what it's projected to do by 2030 and 2050. So anyway, so here's where you get the heat waves and the hurricanes. Here's where the water shortages are the most intense. You can see where the wildfires occur. I mentioned the Hoover Dam and the lake it creates. That's a picture of it. Um, it's down 117 feet in the last 20 years. So where can you go if you have the opportunity to move and 40 million Americans a year do? Where can you go to avoid all this stuff? Well, the answer is pretty much above the 42nd parallel. So all of those cities are, are pretty good bets. Um, the Pacific Northwest is a good bet. They do get the, the beetles eating the trees and they do get the wildfires, but, uh, but none of the other weather effects. They're cool and they're, they're uh, plenty of water up there. And the Great Lakes area. This is really the sweet spot. Um, in the book, I, I, I identified 14 cities that make perfect climate havens. Um, and it's not just, will it be a climate haven? It's also, you know, would you want to live there? <laughs> so, you know, for example, I looked at the population, the cost of living, the average temperature range, are there airports, are there hospitals, are there parks? Is it a good quality of life? Um, the winner, believe it or not, was Madison, Wisconsin, a city built around five lakes, so they'll never run out of fresh water. They have a rule that no building can ever be built taller than the Capitol building that you see here. 
and that means it'll never become a concrete jungle. And it, it gets rated the number one everything in surveys. <laughs> the one one nicest city, most caring city, best city to raise a family, best quality of life. So I'm actually flying out to Madison tonight because I'm doing a story for CBS Sunday Morning on this topic, on climate haven cities. So the mayor is going to give me a tour of Madison tomorrow. Should be fun. Uh, Burlington, Vermont is another great one. They've been seeing an influx of, of mo people moving from California this year because of the wildfires, people fleeing. It does get cold in these cities during the winter, of course, but not as cold as they used to. Already, Burlington is four degrees warmer on average. And they expect 13 more degrees. Um, what's great about Berlin is it feels like a seaside, but it's on a lake. It's Lake Champlain, 500 miles long. Um, highly aided population, low obesity, lowest crime country, great place to live. Cheese, maple syrup, ice cream. I mean, what's what's not to like? Um, Buffalo, right on Lake Erie. They have incredible medical facilities, which is something you're going to need in the new era. The land. They have really good chains. So main thing is great. That's that's the new climate. Uh, next I found interesting was where to invest. Um, if you I, I mean you might you might think it's kind of crass to talk about investment in the of climate change. Um, except that and whenever you invest in a company that profit climate change, you are helping to mitigate climate change. They're working to stop climate change so you're doing good as you do well so it is a wise thing to invest in climate change these are the this is the s and over the last 10 years these in red are fossil fuel stocks traditional energy stocks so if you invested 10 years ago you'd be down um, if you'd invested in clean energy company up 60% in three years. If you'd invested that same money in fossil fuel companies, you'd be in the hole by 12%. So this really is a new area. I think the first most people say is, well, I know, let's invest in solar power. That seems to be the obvious, you know, clean energy play. Um, true that solar power is just on fire. Fire. Look at our this country's capacity just in the last 20 years. I mean, it is really. In fact, if you look at all the new energy capacity building, uh, just in, in 2019, 70% of all new capacity comes from solar and wind installations. And my experts for the book told me there are zero new coal plants. Uh, planned to build in this country. The, in fact, we're taking coal plants offline. In some places, it's actually cheaper to build a solar or a wind farm than it is to keep a coal plant running. Um, I love this. <laughs> this is the Kentucky Coal Mining Zip Museum. And three years ago, they actually installed solar panels on their roof. <laughs> They're saving $10,000 a year, the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum. Um, last, uh, in fact, we, we reached an incredible uh, in U.S. energy consumption. That's the graph of how much coal we use. It's been dropping. The, the graph superimposed much renewable energy. Last year, for the first time, renewable energy actually surpassed coal consumption. Now, a lot of that is not because solar and wind are so great, but because fracking natural gas has taken over but still coal is the worst of the worst it's it's going away so uh the cool thing is that solar power's price has been really really it's been plummeting um that's that's good for the uh good for the planet but for an investor that's a problem because you don't want to invest Who's, that's becoming a commodity, whose value is just dropping. Same thing with wind power. Yes, it's going nuts in the United States. We're getting so much of our power clean, renewable, no emissions, and 
But again, the cost of it is just dropping. It's so cheap to put up wind farms and get free energy. So not a great investment. So how can you exploit the explosion in solar and wind without actually investing in solar panels and wind turbines? Well, there is a way. You invest in the utility companies. See, 38s now have mandates that they must get a certain amount of their power from renewable energy. So like New York, California, and Hawaii have 50% of their power from clean energy 10 years. So these utility companies have a built-in audience. They have a locked in customer. So they are racing to switch to uh, solar and wind so that they'll have, you know, so that they'll make money. Um, so you know, things like NextEra and Excel Energy, those are the ones that are going to benefit as they have guaranteed customers. General investment sectors, water we mentioned, all these companies, like everything needs water, agriculture, oil and gas, the power grid, uh, fabricating electronics and chips, all of that needs massive amount of water. So, um, and, and we mentioned crops, Monsanto and Syngenta are both developing drought resistant, heat resistant crops that will be able to thrive in the new era. So those are good bets. The whole farm belt is shifting. These are little maps of the, uh, the USDA growing zones. And as you can see, the, the warmer areas are shifting northward. So we're going to have to be putting up new farms in new places. And what that means is we're going to have to be selling a lot more farm equipment. So companies like John Deere and Navistar would be good bets because you know they're going to be selling more farm equipment. People ask about electric cars. Is that a good investment? Well, on one hand, um, electric cars are taken over. You may have heard the, the news two weeks ago from General Motors that they're switching hugely over to electric cars. And that, that makes like all of the car companies. All the car companies are now cutting way back on gas cars and developed exclusively new electric cars. And that's not altruism. <laughs> it's because their customers are phasing out gas cars. All of these countries, plus Canada, have said that they're going to phase out gasoline cars. So the writing is on the wall. Electric is the way of the future. And I don't know if you've ever driven one, but they are fantastic <laughs> the the uh on these things and it's just like when you want to accelerate it's there's so much fun to drive and no emissions a tailpipe in fact there isn't a tailpipe there aren't spark plugs there aren't filters there isn't a carburetor there's no tune-ups uh you never no maintenance on these things it's amazing so how can you i mean you could invest in the indiv individual car companies of course but wouldn't it be smarter to invest upstream from all of the car companies, invest in the parts that they're all going to need. So there are only four companies in the world that make electric car batteries. They're all Asian companies, and they're all extremely good bets for investment. Um, you can invest in the components, you know, the actors and the circuitry and the wires. Um, these companies, Aptiv and Valeo, are, that's there. And all of these batteries, lithium-ion batteries, the one in your phone or your laptop, and lithium comes somewhere in mind. It's mined from the earth. So you could invest in the lithium mining companies, um, like Albemarle, which is an American company, or uh, the Sociedad Química y Minera de Chile. Chile. Um, those guys are going to be busy in the coming decades. Um, this might sound really boring to you, but... <laughs> I got really into insurance writing this book. I'm not an expert on any of the top of this book. I'm not a you know investment guy or a tax guy or you know a, a climatologist even. Um, so the book is based on expert interviews. Uh, took me a year. Uh, great, great people. And I, the insurance thing was fascinating to me. My wife says I'm a gas at parties because I can stand there in the corner and talk for two hours about federal flood insurance. But anyway, the, the gist is you basically probably don't know what's in your insurance policy right now. Um, they, they say 15 minutes may save you 15% or more on, on your insurance. 15 minutes is not enough. You need to look over your insurance. Um, Americans are woefully underinsured. 
50% of the population of the United States lives in coastal cities, but only 18% of them have flood insurance. So, I mean, it is just a disaster year to year. And look at the number of claims and amount of claims that we're filing flood claims. I mean, it is just in the last seven years, these numbers are skyrocketing. And I don't know if you gentlemen are aware of this, you might have homeowner's insurance, but homeowner's insurance does not cover flooding. It hasn't in years. So even if you have great insurance your house, it does not cover flood damage. 90% of all flood insurance, which is a separate purchase, comes from the federal, from FEMA. They have this program called the Flood. And the program is desperately in debt because they had all these hurricanes to pay for. And it's also calculated really poorly. Your risk and the amount you pay for this insurance is based exclusively on historical flooding with super coarse measurements like your county, um, not like your house or your elevation. Um, it doesn't look into future flooding and repeat customers are okay. It's car insurance where if you file a claim for flooding, your rates go up for the next time to dissuade you from living in planes. No, your flood insurance stays the same no matter how many times you file a claim. There's this one house in Texas, 1969 has flooded many times. They've collected $2 million from the government and the government never raises their rates. It's it's crazy. The, the Congress is it, but it's a known disaster. So you got to wonder what's going to happen to insurance because we keep reading that in the hurricane and the wildfires, uh, insurers are refusing to renew people. The insurance companies are profit making these and they really have only three le three levers to pull in the new climate era. They can drop customers, they can raise their rates, pull out of the state entirely. And they're they're doing all of these things. I mean, it's getting harder and harder. In California, it, you can't even get wildfire insurance, fire insurance for anything anyone could afford. It's, no one really knows what's going to happen, but it's they're kind of in crisis. Um, and the last thing I think I'd talk, I, I'd talk about are some of the free and easy ways to prepare your house and your family for these extreme weather events. And you might say, you know, oh, I live in Connecticut. We don't get wildfires. You know, what's, what's the big deal? And the big deal is that 25 million Americans a year do get hit by extreme weather disasters and most of them are not prepared. So these are just simple things. One thing I recommend you gentlemen do today is install the, the American Red Cross's app on your phone. It's free, it's called MC. And what's really cool is that you set up several addresses in this. It can be your house, it can be a place of work, your kid's house, your grandchildren's house. And then you just forget about this app. You just leave it buried in your folder somewhere but if there ever is an impending disaster, hurricane storm, even man disasters like a plant explosion or radiation leak, it will start beeping in your attention um, so that you guys have a, more of a chance of getting out and getting safe in time. It's, and it's also got all this information in it about what to do in the emergency, has locations of the Red Cross shelters. It's a free app and you can just install it and forget it until it saves your life. <laughs> now, one thing that all disasters have in common is water contamination. Hurricanes, superstorms, uh, wildfires even, they all contaminate the water supply. And in 700 cities of the U.S., um, oh, yeah, well, actually, I'll, I'll get to water in one second. One, one of the emergency, emergency things I talk about, thought I'd talk about is the, the go bag. And this idea of a bag that contains two days worth of stuff that you could survive on if you have to flee the house, right? So it's, you know, snacks that keep, you know, meal bars, wipes, flashlight, first aid kit, stuff like that. And just before you run out of the house, you know, take some cash and some ID with you um, just in case. And just having that stuck in the front closet is a great 
a relief to you because it means that if you do have to evacuate, you'll be at the front of the line of people trying to snake their cars out of town instead of the back of the line. Um, well, anyway, I started to talk about Wall um, the 700 American cities combined sewage and rain overflow sewer systems, okay? So what happens is during intense rains, water treatment plants get overloaded. And so what they, they have no choice but to dump the raw sewage into the water supply, which is really gross. So you don't want to drink that, you'll get sick. But there is a lot of water within the walls of your house that you don't think about. Your hot water heater, there's 80 gallons of fresh, clean, drinkable water right there. So, you, so in time of a crisis, you turn off the intake at the top, up the, 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 the thing at the bottom and fill up your buckets, let it cool, and you've got water. There's also free, clean, drinkable water in your toilets. Not, not the bowl, unless you're a golden retriever, uh, but in the tank. <laughs> that, is, that is clean, fresh water. And you can also buy storage tanks cheaply at Home Depot that, that keep water fresh and drinkable for five years. Um, and there's also water in your pipes, you know, so you just open up the faucets on the top floor to let it flow on the bottom floor. So there's a bunch of gallons there. It, it beats filling up the, the bathtub when a hurricane is coming. You don't want to drink that stuff unless you have a really nice bathtub. Um, that's more of a gray water situation. Um, good for washing dishes, taking a sponge bath, watering the garden. Um, another thing that happens in a lot of these disasters are power outages. That, they all have that in common. We are, the United States, the leading nation among developed nations in power failures. <laughs> Congratulations, us. Um, so when the power goes out, you really have only one option, and that's a generator. You can get these gas powered ones from Home Depot. They're kind of loud and smelly. And during a crisis, you have to keep them filled up with gas or propane. And gas and propane sometimes sells out. I don't know if you remember during Sandy, it was hard to come by. Um, you can also get an inverter generator. They cost more, but they're much smaller and much quieter. Um, and of course you can get, you know, this is Fairfield County. Why not go for the best? <laughs> Let's get the standby generator. These are the permanently installed automatic ones, much more expensive. Um, although you don't have to have it power the whole house. Like after Hurricane Sandy, we were without power for six days, no internet, no heat, it was awful. So I sprung for one of these standby generators, but it, it covers only the kitchen, the living room and one bedroom. So we saved a lot of money. And you know, if we really have to ride out a few days of cold, we can, we can do it now. Don't have to, it doesn't have to be super expensive. For 15 bucks, you can get a hand cranked generator that also has a flashlight and a, 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 a radio, emergency radio in it. That's enough to charge your phones and at least keep you in contact. Um, another thing that goes out in big crises are the cell towers. Hardly anyone talks about the fact that cell service tends to go out during the big fires and the big disasters. So if you've got family, and you're not together when the disaster is hitting, you need some way to coordinate. So the other thing people say is make a plan now with your family. Figure out four meeting spots, someplace in the house where if it's a hurricane or a superstorm, you're away from windows and you're safe. Could be the basement if it doesn't flood or even a closet upstairs. You want a neighborhood spot like the old craggy tree in front of the Casey's house. And that's if you have to evacuate the house, you'll know where to find the rest of the family. You want a place in town. So if you're at work or the kids are at school or something, you'll all know where to gather if you can't reach each other. And you want an out of town spot, you know, a, a local hotel or something. So that if people are really scattered and you can't, you're not allowed to drive back to your house or to your neighborhood, you have some place to go. They all recommend that you designate an out-of-town relative to be sort of your command center that even if you can't call each other you can all call that person who can help you coordinate so you make this emergency plan you print it out you put it on your in your car glove compartment you put it on the bulletin board in the kitchen and you put it on your phone in the notes app so that everybody has it so three years from now when the disaster hits and nobody can remember what it said you'll have it um, 
here's a bonus one just for Connecticut residents. Um, what the uh, not not everybody uh, doesn't like the rising temperatures of North America. The ticks and the mosquitoes love it. The winters are no longer killing off their populations as they once did. Ticks so actually have two or three reproductive cycles per year instead of just one because the the parent bugs have kids and they don't get killed by the winter so they have a they have grandkids um, so the number of disease cases is skyrocketing these days um, Connecticut is becoming I mean Lyme disease of course the old Lyme Connecticut is in Connecticut um, but the number of Lyme disease cases is just shooting to the skies um, this is this shows the uh, the, the rampant case of tick-borne Lyme disease from 1996 to 2014. And there's an asterisk because Lyme disease is very hard to identify and it's hard to diagnose. So the CDC imagines that the number is actually 10 times harder, higher, but we just aren't reporting it. So it imagines that the number is more like 300,000. So for the book, I did a lot of research about ticks and they're, they're really interesting. Uh, some of this stuff is actually reassuring. Most of them don't carry disease. Only certain kinds carry disease. And of those, only a subset have the disease. You can cure Lyme disease for good with antibiotics if you take them promptly. Ticks can't fly or jump. I, I hear this, you know, ooh, they're up in the branches. They're going to jump down on you. No, they don't. They they can't even see, they have no eyes, and they do not wait up above you. What they do is they stand on their hind legs on a branch and they kind of wave their arms until an animal or a person walks by and then they grab onto it, hoping to find a meal. Um, if you are gonna go out for hikes and you're wearing shorts, wear a DEET-based repellent, it works. It's the most studied chemical in human application history. It works great and it's safe. This is also kind of wild. Ticks require humidity. If it's under 82% humidity, ticks dry out and die. So you can use that information. Like uh, you get back from like, what the experts do is they take off their clothes and just stick them in the dryer for 10 minutes. And the dry heat kills whatever is on the clothes. And while it's in the dryer, you, you look yourself over, you know, the, the hairy parts and you make sure there are no ticks on you. Even if a tick is on you, you can't get Lyme disease until it's been on you for 48 hours. So if you can find that tick within 48 hours, you're safe from the disease. Um, and with that humidity thing comes this great thing. You make a moat around your house of nine feet of lawn or, or some other uh, bushes free area. To ticks, that's dally. They can't cross it. They can't get to you. So just remember this, you know, it's kryptonite. Uh, humidity, dry humidity is kryptonite. Um, ignore what you hear from the internet. If you do find a tick, uh, remove it from the head um, with a pair of tweezers. Do not use Vaseline. Do not use a match. Do not use a candle. Grab it by the head of the tweezers and pull straight out. Um, one of the things we talked about, my editor and I, when I was working on this book was, Another thing that happens is social unrest. So think of Hurricane Katrina, you know, when when the 17 percent of the police force not only didn't show up for work, but they were found among the looters. The policemen were among the looters. Um, so things do break down um, in California during the wildfires. I mean, there's there's chaos. There's no sense of authority. So there is a chapter in the book on social breakdown and what to do. And my editor said, well, what are you going to do? Tell people to get a gun? And, you know, that's a, a tough question. Um, beliefs about guns are very strong depending on where you live and the culture you grew up in. Um, of course, we all know the statistics about the having a gun in the house. You know, 13,000 children are actually shot every year um, by guns that are in their own homes. Gun owners are twice as likely to be murdered and three times as likely to commit suicide. So I spoke to a survivalist guy. He was fantastic. He's a gun owner. And he said, you know what? A gun is not the solution. If you're worried about home invasion during a crisis, what you want is lighting. 
because nobody like like automatic lighting like for 10 bucks at home depot you can get these solar powered automatic lights that, that deprive home intruders of decent hiding places they don't particularly care about robbing your house they just want to rob somebody's house so if yours is lit well they'll look for one that offers better concealment and if you do want a weapon he recommended this thing i'd never heard of it it's called a tactical flashlight these are the ones used by the military and law enforcement. They're, they're rugged and aluminum, shock, shockproof, and incredibly bright. You get blasted in the face with one of these, you're disoriented, you're blinded. Um, criminals, muggers, and drug addicts hate drawing attention to themselves. Uh, a guy on Reddit said, I've actually good, had good luck with just shining one of these in the intruder's face and saying, I've defused quite a few sketchy individuals just with this blinding flashlight. So, gentlemen, I know that a lot of this has been probably alarming and upsetting and depressing, and yeah, I'm with you there. But I have to point out that there is also a final chapter in the book and a final way to think of this, which is there are some really promising signs of hope in turning this thing around. This is a graph of our greenhouse emissions uh, in the last 20 years. We have flattened the curve, gentlemen. We are lowering greenhouse gas emissions in this country, especially during the pandemic, by the way. Wow! Between 10 and 17 percent drop in emissions because nobody's driving, nobody's flying, the factories aren't running. I mean, that's the bad news. Um, and that's all going to come back. But we are pumping out so many fewer emissions. Again, that's largely because of natural gas, uh, not because of switching to clean energy, but, but that's part of it. During the last four years, as you know, our federal government took no action on climate change. In fact, the president ordered the words climate change erased from all the federal department's websites. Um, but 24 states charged right on ahead anyway and said, you know what, we're going to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, even though the nation has pulled out of it. So they, these states have been chugging right along, uh, trying to lower greenhouse gas emissions and stop climate change, as well as all of these cities. Some of these, these are the ones that have committed to switching to 100% renewable energy. And some of those cities are already there. These cities are already 100% renewable energy. So it's entirely possible. New investment is pouring into clean energy in this country. And, you know, it's very common to blame corporations as being heartless polluters. But in fact, these days, it's really bad news for a corporation to be a polluter and not to do something about their climate emissions, because not just the customers, but also their investors care, and increasingly their employees care. Their employees will revolt if, they're, if the mothership is not doing something some of the things that tech companies are doing are doing incredible. Uh, Alphabet, which is Google's mothership, um, has been 100% renewable energy for four years now. Amazon will be carbon neutral by 2040. That means they will, n they will not add any new carbon to the atmosphere. I mean, they will, but they will also be removing an equivalent amount um, in the form of uh, climate offsets, which is basically buying farmers to plant trees. Um, they're switching to all electric delivery vans. Uh, they're spending $10 billion to fund climate science. Apple has been 100% renewable since 2018. And by 2030, this is really ambitious, the entire cycle of Apple, including all their suppliers, the manufacturing, the life cycle of the products, all of that will be carbon neutral. Microsoft intends by 2050 to have removed all the carbon it's ever put into the air since its founding in 1979. It's just an astonishing goal. Um, you know, we'll see if these companies make those goals, but at least that they've, they've publicly stated them is super promising. So in general, um, I like to make the point that preparing for climate change brings you two benefits. I mean, there's the obvious one, you'll be ready in a disaster the next time we in Connecticut get hit by these extreme rains or flooding or another hurricane, we'll be physically ready and therefore we'll save 
you know, both our health and our finances. But there's a sort of stealth reason to prepare now, and that's a psychological one. It's a mental health issue. Scientists have shown that if you feel depressed or helpless or frightened, taking action, giving yourself some control over your situation is a sure antidote. So you feel better knowing that you're prepared, knowing that if the worst comes to pass, you'll be ready. So in general, decarbonization will come. It'll take 80 years, but we are going to get away from, from greenhouse gas burning uh, fuels. Um, until that time, though, uh, you have only one option is to prepare. So there is a quick summary, gentlemen. I'm um, happy to take your questions, your comments, your, your rebuttals, your glow. Um, and anything else you have to say? Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, oh, we have. Oh, I saw something in the chat. I thought that might be questions. So. It, it, this is Stu, David. Uh, thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. Um, if folks have any questions, please um, raise your hand on the system. Go to the participant tab at the bottom of your screen if you've got a PC and uh, click the uh, raise your hand if there are any questions. Um, do that now. Stu, can you? Okay, if I, Joe D. All right, Joe, go ahead. No one uh, else. David, uh, what's the easiest way to buy your book? <laughs> straight, That's my straight favorite man. question. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> and you can pay what, me what later. Did you say, $10 to ask that question? Uh, exactly. Checks in the mail. Um, just go right off to Amazon.com right now and, and order it, and it'll oh. come to you in 12 days when it's published. Excellent. I should mention, uh, by Excellent the way, presentation. This, thank you. Uh, Larry Holtzman. Thank you, sir. Uh, David, great presentation. A question about electric vehicles. Uh, what about, uh, will there be enough charging stations? And where will the electricity generating capacity come from to serve all these electronic, uh, electric generating stations, car generating That's stations? A fantastic question. Very shrewd of you. Um, so first of all, there are tens of thousands of charging stations now. I'm I own a lot, and <clears throat> man, do I love that car! Oh man, I my my daughter goes to school in Middlebury in Vermont, and so I can get from here to there without recharging, um, which is amazing. But if I ever have to go somewhere farther, like to California, um, when you put in the GPS of car, it builds in the charging stops on the way. It includes where they are and it incorporates that as your directions. And they're always, the charging stations are always in places where there are restaurant stops and things to do. So you're always got, you know, something to go to. And, and the new Tesla charging stations are so fast. In, in 11 minutes, you, you, uh, the electricity comes from the grid I, I'll, I'll even take your question farther. A lot of people say, what would do us to switch to electric cars? We still have to generate power somewhere, right? So how is it any improvement in gasoline cars? And the answer is twofold. One is an enormous economy of scale in manufacturing the electricity as a, at a centralized plant instead of what gas cars do, where it, which is where a single car is its own fuel factory making electricity. Um, and second, every passing year, more of the electricity comes from renewable clean. So uh, the longer we go on, the more of our electric cars will be charged up with clean energy that produces no emissions. Um, so yeah, there, there's, uh, there's definitely enough electricity. That's not really the issue. Um, will tell you that, I mean, obviously I haven't used a gas station and electricity does cost something, but it costs about a quarter to a gasoline does. So I'm coming out way ahead. 
Thank you. Uh, Franco. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, the question I have for you is uh, in relation to this climate change, of course, we see the agricultural land uh, can be cropped, uh, goes up, up on the, the north part. And there is a risk, especially in Siberia, of the permafrost losing and the increasing of the gas emission. Um, any thought about uh, this expanding uh, surface of the agricultural area? and the, the risk of a large portion of the north of the, uh, Siberia to become a, a culprit for gas emission. To become a, a culprit, a, a reason for gas emission. Oh, you, you know, what I've heard mostly about the shifting agricultural area and Greenland are now being developed for agriculture. I mean, these, these places that used to be frozen tundra are now becoming temperate and are becoming the new breadbasket. Um, I mean, the emissions that I know about from Siberia are from the wildfires and they're gigantic and problematic, but I also know those areas, breadbasket of the future, the companies are racing out in Siberia. Uh, I was uh, talking about the methane. Uh, that, uh, the oh, the methane. Yes. 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 I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so methane, you don't hear as much about it as carbon dioxide because there's not as much of it. But methane is 80 times worse at trapping heat, carbon dioxide. And yes, as Siberia and Greenland thaw, permafrost thaw it releases trapped methane. Uh, yeah, I, I, know, I know of no, it's massively depressing. Um, it is a gigantic source of methane. Uh, and it's, I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. It's one of these things that, that perpetuate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Arkady. Art. Art, you're, you're it's muted. 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 Art's muted. Okay, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so, according to your presentation, in short 10 years, Florida will be basically sinking. <laughs> so where do you, what state do you suggest to move? And people apparently who move to Florida make a big mistake, right? You are moving to the coast of Florida. You are making a big mistake. This I guarantee you. The property values are already, I was just reading in Miami, an Oceanside house now costs 14% less than the identical house uphill just because of the flooding risk and the hurricane risk. So the answer is you want to move. I, I had a, a few slides. But the ideal places to be are not Arizona and not Florida. I would look north above the 42nd parallel. Um, the, the Great Lakes area and the Pacific are largely shielded from climate problems. Um, and they're also great places to live. I myself am flying to Madison, Wisconsin this afternoon, which is one of the, supposed to be one of the best clients. Okay, thank you. Uh, Al Alperti. Uh, okay, hi, David. Nice, nice job. What about the other sources of energy, uh, like fuel cells or hydrogen or nuclear? I, I think, I don't know how they contribute to climate change. What, do, what are your thoughts on those? Great. Yeah, they, they are all fantastic for climate change, right? Hydrogen cell cars, they have a tail path that comes out of it, but water, I mean, you can drink it. Um, and there are at least three new efforts to nuclear power that does not come from uh, dangerous or explodable. So um, there are these thorium reactors. Thorium is another element. Thorium, which is very handle, as you know, Thorium 
is not nearly as dangerous. And Bill Gates and others are working on developing thorium reactors that would have none of the danger. It turns out that when the United States developed nuclear power, we were simultaneously interested in developing nuclear weapons. So we were deliberately looking for the most lethal element to make our nuclear power from. That's no longer our priority. So nuclear power that's safe could be an enormous um, hydrogen is trickier because, um, you know, already we heard people are charging stations for electric cars. Now we're talking about creating an entire global network of hydrogen filling stations, which it could happen. And a lot of people will, um, but it would take a really long entire realm of cars that would have to be developed. Okay. Any other questions? Not not seeing any other questions. David, thank you so much for um, sharing your thoughts uh, about the climate change. Um, besides being interesting and uh, and useful, it's kind of scary. Um, <laughs> so I hope we all learned something from what you had to say. And um, again, thanks for joining us. And um, we'll be in touch. Appreciate it. Thank you much, Ellen. And David has uh, also given presentations to some of the other groups on the uh, electric car, I believe. That's right. And uh, maybe you can uh, schedule David uh, later on this spring uh, and give the talk on the electric cars that come highly recommended. I'll write it down. Happy to join you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, all. Thank you, David. All well, yours, Joe. Okay. Uh, thank you, Stu, uh, for having the uh, presentation today. Your first, uh, <laughs> you didn't have that many questions to uh, sort out, but uh, I thought it was a very good presentation. And uh, guys, we saw the result of the poll. And uh, let's see, somebody's wanted to chat with something. Okay, that's, uh, everybody stay safe, stay well, sign up for your shots, and uh, God bless. We'll see you next week. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. So long, guys. <laughs>